You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Volk. Of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk. And you're not. Obviously, there were no shows yesterday. It was Labor Day. Hope you had a restful Labor Day. Admittedly, I did not. I went to Yankee Stadium yesterday to see my team get shellacked by the Blue Jays. Somehow, someway, the Yankees are still a half game up on the Red Sox. I found myself rooting for the Rays yesterday. That was an interesting feeling. And then after that, I had my Dynasty Fantasy Football Draft. We all know how stressful those can be. I'll tell you something interesting that happened there. I was gonna take Travis Etienne. Yes, I know that he's out for the year, but it's a dynasty league. Let me keep him on IR, and then next year, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Maybe he'll be a keeper, maybe I'll let him go back into the draft. I just wanted the option. Two picks before I was going to take him, he was selected. And what's worse is I had the pick before. It was on the turn. I took Latavius Murray instead. I didn't think that the guy's name is Mike. I didn't think that Mike would take him. Just from what I know about Mike and... The way his roster was set up, I didn't think he would take Etienne. I was wrong. It's not the end of the world, but I did have to break out a stress ball. So did I have Labor Day off? The answer really is no. You didn't get any shows yesterday, but I was doing things that caused me angina. I should have done what Sean Marks did. Marks got all his work done before Labor Day, so he was able to enjoy it. He could just take a day off and do nothing because of what he did on Friday. Trading DeAndre Jordan, signing LaMarcus Aldridge, cutting Alizé Johnson, Absolutely fantastic moves. I'm driving to the Bronx on Friday. And I get the news that the Nets traded DeAndre Jordan. It was Jordan and four picks in the second round. And $5.78 million to the Pistons for Sekou Dumboya and Jaleel Okafor. The Pistons are going to buy out Jordan. He's going to go to the Lakers. Have fun in L.A. According to Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, the Nets will save $47 million in salary and tax because they got rid of Jordan. Then you hear that the Nets are probably going to waive Okafor. They're waiving Alizé Johnson. So it's like, okay, they're getting their front court in order. Maybe they're preparing for LaMarcus Aldridge. Maybe there's another move coming that we don't foresee. Who knows what Sean Marks? 
Then you get the news that the Nets did it. They signed LaMarcus Aldridge. So just think about it. The Nets replaced DeAndre Jordan and Alizé Johnson with LaMarcus Aldridge and Sekou Dumboya. Yes, they had to kick in four second rounders. Yes, they had to kick in 5.78 mil. But these moves get the Nets infinitely closer to a title than they were a week ago. Truthfully, after the Nets signed Millsap, I wasn't 100% confident that they were going to sign Aldridge. Yeah, you heard that the Nets were the front runner, but did you really think that he'd come to the Nets along with Millsap, along with Blake Griffin, along with Patty Mills, along with Bruce Brown? Would the Nets get that lucky? Yes. The Nets now have, without question, the best roster in the NBA. It's not even close. I don't think the Lakers are that close to the Nets. Think about the starting five. James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, Blake Griffin, and LaMarcus Aldridge. I don't know if this is what Steve Nash is going to do, but this is what I would do if I was him. Off the bench, you got Patty Mills, Bruce Brown, Joe Harris, Paul Millsap, and Nick Claxton. Show me a weak spot. There are no holes on that team. And the depth is nothing short of unreal. Javon Carter, Cam Thomas, James Johnson, Sekou Dumboya, and Dayron Sharp. All five of those guys are good enough to get rotational minutes on almost every other team in the NBA. What was the thing that people said about a Lakers-Nets matchup? Yes, the Nets are better in the backcourt, but in the frontcourt, the Lakers have it all day. Now that's not true. I'll take the Nets front court over the Lakers front court. Yes, Anthony Davis is better than any front court player that the Nets have. If I'm not counting Kevin Durant as a front court player, if I'm putting him at the three, Davis is obviously better than Griffin. He's better than Aldridge. He's better than Millsap, etc., etc., etc. But once you get past Davis, it's all Nets. Think about the group of Blake Griffin and LaMarcus Aldridge. Both of those guys are better than Melo. They're better than Trevor Ariza. They're better than Dwight Howard. They're better than Marcus Saul. And they're better than DeAndre Jordan. You want to put Mello and Dwight over Millsap and Claxton? I'll give you that. You know that I'm not a big Millsap lover. I get why Marks went out and signed him. And I do think he can work as the backup for But I do think that Mello and Dwight are just better than him. But here's the thing, though. How effective is Anthony Davis going to be with guys like Griffin and Aldridge and Claxton guarding him? We saw Blake Griffin make Giannis work. Yeah, Giannis went off because Giannis is Giannis. And Anthony Davis will get his, but Griffin's going to make AD work. Aldridge will make AD work. From a pure talent standpoint, 
you'd think that the Lakers measure up well with the Nets. But, based on what I saw from Griffin and Aldridge in their short time as Nets, I do think they're going to make AD work. You want to tell me that the Lakers front court is better still? All right, fine. Maybe you can make that argument, but I'll tell you, it's close. It's closer than you think it is. I saw someone say that what Marx has done since the first wave of free agency is, in essence, buying health insurance on guys like Durant, Harden, and Kyrie. Finding guys who can carry the load if and when they miss time. Yeah, that's exactly what this is. The reason that the Nets lost to the Bucks was because towards the end of that series, only Kevin Durant was capable of carrying that offense. Realize, Kyrie got hurt, and James Harden wasn't at 100%. Now think about the players that they've added. Patty Mills would make a huge difference in that series. Same thing with a guy like Millsap. Same thing with a guy like Aldridge. If you put any one of those three guys on the net in Game 7, the Nets win. It doesn't go into overtime. The Nets meet the Hawks in the Eastern Conference Finals. They beat the Hawks, and then they beat the Suns in the NBA Finals. There are no holes on this team whatsoever. They're really prepared for anything. Even if it's the nightmare scenario and the big three is out. Think about the lineup that they can put out there. Mills, Brown, Harris, Griffin, Aldridge. Then the bench is Carter, Thomas, Johnson, Millsap, and Claxton. That team is good enough to win some games. Maybe not against the top, top teams in the NBA, but against more middle-of-the-road teams and further down. Yeah, that team can win. I don't foresee any scenario where the Nets won't be able to field a competent team. And let's be honest, the team that the Nets put out there in Game 7, I don't want to say it wasn't competent, but... In a perfect world, it isn't what you'd want it to be. You wouldn't want James Harden playing 53 minutes when it's clear he's not at 100%. You wouldn't want Bruce Brown playing just under 53 minutes when he's really not a threat to score except by penetrating. You wouldn't want Joe Harris playing 47 minutes when he's ice cold. But that's what Steve Nash was forced to do. He only had two bench players that he trusted. Jeff Green and Landry Shamit. Now, he has like 10. Okay, I see that James Harden isn't at 100%. I'm going to play him because he's James Harden 
and a 50% James Harden is better than half the players in the NBA, but I don't want to play him a full game. Patty Mills, get in there. Joe Harris is ice cold. You know what? I'll put Bruce Brown in there. If I need a little bit more offense, I'll even put Millsap in at the three. He's played that in the past. There's just no scenario I can foresee except some crazy coronavirus thing where the Nets won't be able to field a really good roster. Signing Aldridge just put this team over the top. This team is without question one of the greatest assemblages of talent in NBA history. The only team that rivals it is Russell Celtics. Jordan's Bulls, this team is better. Any Lakers team you want to throw out there, whether it's a Kobe team, a Magic team, a Kareem team, a Worthy team, whatever, this next team is better. Larry Celtics, this team is better. Signing Aldridge basically guarantees that this team is going to win 60 games and has a chance to win 65. I mean, think about it this way. The Nets won 48 games last year. That was with Durant missing a lot of time. That was with Harden missing a lot of time. That was with Kyrie missing some time. And that was in 10 less games. We thought that last year's Nets team was stacked. This team is even more stacked. It's going to win a dozen more games. It just is. That's how much better they've gotten. Think about it. They replaced guys like Jeff Green, Landry Shamit, DeAndre Jordan, and Mike James with guys like Patty Mills, Paul Millsap, and LaMarcus Aldridge. It's almost impossible to improve a team more that was already great than what the Nets just did. Excellent job by Sean Marks. But I'm not done talking about the Nets. I want to talk about the trade of DeAndre Jordan. The fact that the Nets were able to trade him without having to give up a first is insane. The four seconds that the Nets gave up were their own pick in 2022, the Wizards' second rounder in 2024, the Warriors' second in 2025, and their own second in 2027. If given the choice between giving up any number of second rounders or a first rounder, I'm giving up those seconds. Yes, second rounders can turn into great players. But more often than not, they really don't amount to much. There's a reason that Marx was stockpiling all of these seconds. It was so that he could add some young players, but also so he could have the currency to make these types of trades. To get rid of a guy in Jordan who was so bad that he couldn't even play in garbage time means that you've got to kick in second rounders. That's just how it works. And to save the Nets $47 million, you know that Joe Sy's going to love that. 
I'm kind of surprised that the Nets traded Jordan. Yes, we heard rumors that they were interested in trading him or buying him out or something like that, but given how close he is to Durant and Kyrie, I can't say Harden because there were moments where Harden and Jordan got into it a little bit. But given how close he is to Durant and Kyrie, I'm a little surprised that the Nets pulled the trigger on it. But you know what? I commend Durant and Kyrie for saying, yeah, we have no problem with you getting rid of him. That's what's in the best interest of the team. That gives you the ability to add a guy like Dumboya who's no slouch, and I'll get into him in a minute, but this'll make Joe Sy's life a little easier. Makes no sense to have a cheerleader making 10 mil a year. Yeah, you can trade him. The Nets are probably gonna waive Jaleel Okafor, which, okay, I have no problem with that. There's no room for him. He wouldn't get any playing time. He'd be behind Dayron Sharp. Sure, whatever. Dumboya is interesting, though. Yes, he has not put it together with the Pistons. But watch him play. He does have... A lot of the raw tools that make you think maybe, just maybe, he can develop into something solid. He's very athletic. He's got a long wingspan. He's a bruiser inside. And he's very young. He's 20 years old. I'm not going to give up on a 20-year-old who I had a top 10 grade on in not this past draft and not the draft before, but the draft before that. It's just too early for me to give up on him. Here's how Dumboya is going to work out with the Nets. He's got to realize that he's not going to play a lot, which will be upsetting to him, obviously, but... That's just the nature of the beast. But he's got to be the first one in the gym and the last one out. Kevin Durant is like the perfect mentor for him. They're both very athletic. They both have fantastic frames for basketball. I do see some similarities between Dumboya and Durant. Obviously, Dumboya isn't in the same universe as Durant, okay? We all know that. You don't need me to say that. But from just a physical standpoint, I see some similarities there. And here's the thing. One thing that the Nets did in the draft is load up on young players. Not necessarily for them to play next year. Depending on injuries, Thomas and Sharp will get their chances, but in the year after, depending on how they do in the G League or if they sign with an international team, Maybe, just maybe, the Nets bring him in and say, you're going to be a backup for us. Here's the thing. If I'm looking past this coming season, and I'm looking at the season after, the Nets have a lot of question marks. Forget the fact that Harden and Kyrie haven't re-signed yet. I think they will. I find it hard to believe that Durant would re-sign with the Nets 
if Harden and Kyrie aren't also going to resign, but if I'm moving past that, Patty Mills will be a free agent, Nick Claxton will be a free agent, Blake Griffin will be a free agent, LaMarcus Aldridge will be a free agent, Bruce Brown will be a free agent, and Paul Millsap will be a free agent. So there's an opportunity for a guy like Dumboya if he balls out in the G League and works hard in the gym, plays well in garbage time, plays well when injuries result in him getting extra playing time to get a meaningful role on the Nets next year. Let me tell you something. A bench of Cam Thomas, Sekou Dumboya, and Dayron Sharp sounds really good to me. Like, I'll take the chance on those three guys. I'll take the chance that they'll develop into solid players. I mean, we know that the Nets have a history of developing guys, not just veterans. But younger players, too. They developed Joe Harris. They developed Spencer Dinwiddie. D'Angelo Russell doesn't become the player he became if he never gets to Brooklyn. It's possible that Demboya turns into that. Maybe not a player like Russell or Harris or Dinwiddie, but a solid role player. The Nets are set up fantastically well for the next 15 months. Sean Marks built a team that can win this coming season and is set up for success the season after. Do you have any idea how hard that is? To build a team simultaneously to win one year and to have a chance at winning the year after without signing any superstar free agents, it's next to impossible. I mean, realize there was no Durant or Kyrie level player in free agency that came to the Nets. They got really, really, really good players. They'll help the Nets win this year. The season after, probably not. But you can find veteran centers in free agency, sign here on a one-year deal, and get your first ring. That's done all the time with big men in the NBA. Hey, Joe Harris, you're going to be a starter again. Hey, Javon Carter, you really impressed us with your perimeter defense. You're going to be our backup point guard. You'll fill a role similar to Bruce Brown. Hey, Kessler Edwards, we really like you. You're going to be the backup small forward. Maybe the Nets can get someone at the end of the second round with a lot of talent. I don't know. It's too early to prognosticate on that. The point is... The Nets are set up fantastically well for the immediate future and the more distant future. And as for Alizé Johnson being waived, yeah, you had a sense that he wouldn't stick with the Nets. He's really a one-trick pony. He's just a rebounder. Yeah, the Nets could use a little rebounding, but... If that's all you can do, you really don't have a spot on the Nets. He went to the Bulls. I'm happy for him. He has a chance to produce there. Because I'm not 100% sold on Patrick Williams. I'm happy for Johnson that he's getting the chance to actually show what he can do. Because I think he's a solid player. He just wasn't going to get a chance to do anything with the Nets. 
Okay, I spent way too much time on the net, but what can I say? I'm a diehard Nets fan. I'll stop singing their praises for a little bit to give you some college football Volk talk. We had some great games last week. We even had some upsets. Let's get into it now with UNC versus Virginia Tech. It's kind of interesting. Sam Howell was picked by some to be a Heisman Trophy contender, to be the first quarterback taken in the 2022 draft. Obviously, it's too early to cast judgment either way, but he did not play well against a Virginia Tech team that I don't think anyone expects to be anything special this year. They'll be solid, they just won't be fantastic. Howell looked lost. He completed just over 50% of his passes for just over 200 yards. He threw three interceptions. Look, I understand that this is a new UNC team to a certain extent. You've got Ty Chandler coming in from Tennessee. You've got Josh Downs stepping into a bigger role. And Downs played well, and so did Chandler. I'm not knocking them. It just can be hard for a quarterback to adapt to these newer players. In the college ranks, you see it all the time. The thing is, though, when I hear from people that Howell's a Heisman Trophy contender, and he could be the first quarterback taken in the draft, I just expect more. Howell was really disappointing. Again, too early to cast judgment either way, but... I was not impressed with what I saw on Friday. I was impressed with the offensive line, the tackles, Joshua Izudu, and Jordan Tucker looked really good, Marcus McKethan looked really good, he's the right guard. Defensively, UNC was outstanding. Virginia Tech really couldn't get much going. They had less than 300 total yards on the game. It was just the offense that really let the Tar Heels down. Now, I'll give the Hokies credit because they did have some players on defense play really well. Narell Pollard, Jermaine Waller, Nasir Peoples. And Dorian Strong really balled out. I mean, give Virginia Tech credit. This is a marquee upset. It's the kind of thing that's going to give them confidence going forward. They've got a few cupcake games coming up, but when they face the big boys, Justin Fuente can say, hey, We beat a UNC team that was ranked 10th in the nation. Why can't we beat this team? We're talented enough to do it. We've just got to go out and do it. The Hokies will be good this year. Not great, but they'll be good. UNC should be good, but they should have beaten the Hokies. This loss really didn't give me a lot of confidence in them. Moving on now to Penn State, Wisconsin. Penn State has a reputation of being 
a great defensive school. They lived up to that on Saturday. Graham Mertz, a talented quarterback, someone who I like, threw for under 200 yards and threw two interceptions. Wisconsin held the ball for over 42 minutes. You know how many points they scored in the game? 10! What was the biggest moment in that game? Fourth and goal at the two-yard line. Penn State up 16-10. to Wisconsin has a chance to tie or take the lead, but Mertz throws an interception to Jaquan Brisker. Man, I'll tell you, Brisker was all over the place making plays. He was nothing short of incredible. Him, Jesse Lukita, Arnold Ebikidi, and Nick Tarburton. I'll throw Jonathan Sutherland in there also. Were great. But I'll tell you. I know that Paul Christ is going to be very upset over some things that happened early in that game. In the second quarter, the Badgers had first and goal at the two-yard line. They had to settle for a field goal try that got blocked. They had the ball at the eight-yard line. They fumbled it away. Wisconsin had their opportunities. They just folded like cheap suits. Every single player on that team choked. You've got the opportunity to have a statement win early in the season to give you a ton of confidence going forward and you just lay the biggest egg possible. You control the ball for 42 minutes and 25 seconds. You only end up with 10 points. If that doesn't make your blood boil, I don't know what will. I wasn't even impressed with them defensively. Jack Sanborn played well, but of course he did. He's a great player. I thought Sean Clifford made smart decisions. It was a simple game plan by the Nittany Lions, but it was executed perfectly. Sorry, Dad, but this was a great win for James Franklin. My father doesn't like Franklin because he left Vanderbilt for Penn State. And my father went to Vanderbilt. Moving on now to Indiana, Iowa. A game that I thought was going to be great. Turned into an absolute drubbing. It's amazing how bad Indiana was in this game. Here's a team that some people thought would be in CFP contention. I heard Michael Penix get Heisman Trophy buzz. Instead, the guy throws for just 156 yards and three picks? Inexcusable. Hallelujah, he got Ty Freifogel involved. Of course he did. Freifogel's their best skill position player. The Iowa defense was outstanding. Riley Moss, Zach Van Valkenburg, Noah Shannon, Dane Belton, Matt Hankins, Logan Lee, and Lucas Van Ness were all incredible. I mean, it's kind of funny. You'd think with a score like 34-6, to the Hawkeyes' offense would have shown up. It really didn't. Tyler Goodson was eh, had one big run, but that was it. If you take the touchdown run out of the equation... He had 18 runs for 43 yards. That's terrible. 
Spencer Petros was really, really bad. He completed under 50% of his passes. Sam Laporta was good. Woo! I'll give the kicker credit. Caleb Shudak. He looked good. Didn't miss a single kick. The story of this game is the Iowa defense. A defense that had two pick sixes. Both by Riley Moss. Watch out for him. Seems like he's going to turn into a really good player. Great game defensively for the Hawkeyes. Not the kind of game that gives you confidence in their offense. But when the defense shows up like that, your offense can underwhelm. Moving on now to Alabama picking up where they left off last year by destroying their opponents. This time, it was the U that got creamed. I can't even knock the U. I know that their fans are upset that they lost, okay? They have every right to be. The thing is, though, it's Alabama. It's hard for me as an outsider to criticize a team for losing to Alabama. Oh, but they're without Mac Jones. They're without Devontae Smith. They're without Jalen Waddell. They're without Najee Harris. They're without Landon Dickerson. Yeah, they're still really good. In fact, they're more than that. They're a national title contender. Bryce Young... The backup to Mac Jones last year absolutely balled out. Completed over 70% of his passes for 344 yards and four touchdowns. The Crimson Tide's running game was sensational. Brian Robinson, Trace Sanders, and Jace McClellan all averaged at least four yards per carry. Eight players from Alabama had multiple catches. What's even more impressive to me is that Alabama's offensive line really wasn't that good. Young was pressured. He had to improvise a lot, and he did. It's okay if you hate Alabama, because they're so dominant. I mean, college football does better when it has a lot of upsets and one extremely dominant team that you just can't beat. Alabama's that team that you just love to hate. I wouldn't say that I hate Alabama, but my God. Every game of theirs is a blowout. Give someone else a chance. Like, my father has a saying when a a, a team scores against the Crimson Tide. Why did you do that? You're just going to make them upset. In other words, it doesn't matter what you do. You're going to lose this game. Can't argue with that. Outstanding job by the Crimson Tide. This was a statement win. I really can't get too upset at the Hurricanes for losing. Yeah, their fans can, but outside looking in, what do you expect? Moving on now to Louisiana Lafayette getting destroyed by Texas, 38-18. A really, really disappointing game for the Raging Cajuns. I thought they'd be motivated, given what happened with Hurricane Ida, to go out there and upset Texas in Texas. But their defense was just terrible. Texas's defense bent, but it didn't break. 
Levi Lewis played well. I really liked what he did out there. Completed over 70% of his passes for 282 yards and a touchdown. Spread the ball around really well. Eight Raging Cajuns had at least two catches. And I didn't think that the offensive line was really that good outside of Max Mitchell and A.J. Gilly. The thing is, though, their defense was just abysmal. They made Hudson Card look like the second coming of Vince Young. I mean, here's a guy in Card who had to battle to even get the starting job, was not the favorite. Casey Thompson was the favorite, but Card beat him out. Card was outstanding. Completed two-thirds of his passes... For 224 yards and two touchdowns, he ran for another touchdown. Bijan Robinson went off for over 100 yards. Jordan Whittington was really good, seven catches for 113 yards and a touchdown. Steve Sarkeesian has gotten off on the right foot with the Longhorns. He's got to keep it up. While this is a really good win, as we all know, if he falters even just a little bit, Longhorns fans are going to turn on him like crazy. Moving on now to the game of the week that wasn't. Georgia Clemson. I mean, if you like defensive struggles, that's fine, but I feel like the offense still needs to do something. It's got to show a little bit of life. Neither offense showed up. Now, granted, that was because the Bulldogs' defense and the Tigers' defense was so fantastic. But, all I heard from people going into this year was that DJ Uyunglele, believe it or not, that I can pronounce, would be excellent in replacing Trevor Lawrence. And JT Daniels, coming back to school, would lead Georgia to heights that it hasn't seen since Vince Dooley was there. Instead, both quarterbacks underwhelmed. You know who the most impressive player offensively was in that game? Zamir White. To have 13 carries for 74 yards against that Clemson defense? That's really impressive. That's 5.7 yards per carry. But I got so excited for this game, and the only touchdown I saw was a pick six from Chris Smith. Give Smith credit. He was outstanding. Everyone on Georgia was defensively. And Clemson put together a good team effort. If I had to pick a couple standouts, It would be Andrew Booth and Balin Spector. But everyone showed up for Georgia. Everyone stood out to me. Like one play, it was Smith making a big play. The next play, it was Latavius Brinney. Or Jordan Davis or Devontae Wyatt, Lewis Sign, Amir Speed, Quay Walker. It was absurd. I saw people saying that if Georgia can do this against Clemson, imagine what it can do against a team like Florida or Alabama or LSU. You know, they've got a great chance of shutting those teams down, right? 
I don't want to take anything away from the Georgia defense. It was outstanding. There's no question about that. But how sold are we on Clemson? Like, how sold are we on DJ? I gotta be honest with you. I feel like he's really overrated. All I heard from people was that he'd take over for Lawrence seamlessly. Clemson wouldn't miss a beat. They'd be national title contenders. Twice, DJ has failed to show that he can be that guy. What were the two games that he started last year? Boston College and Notre Dame. Boston College nearly beat Clemson. They were up 28 to 13 at the half. DJ engineered a big comeback, give him credit, but that game shouldn't have been as close as it was. And against the Fighting Irish, DJ lost. He had multiple opportunities to really put that game away, and he didn't. Now against an NFL-caliber defense in Georgia, he lays an egg? Like, how sure are we that he's going to be great? Of course he's going to ball out against South Carolina State on Saturday. It's South Carolina State. They're an FCS school. That doesn't mean anything to me. I gotta be honest with you. I'm skeptical of DJ. He's gotta prove me wrong sooner rather than later for me to change my mind on him. I want Clemson to run the table from here on out. And you can't tell me that that's an unreasonable ask. Because the ACC this year really isn't that good. The last college football game that I want to talk about is UCLA upsetting LSU. Firstly, let me just say that I still like LSU. I think they can make a little bit of noise. I don't see them being a CFP team, but I think they'll be good. It wouldn't surprise me if they were in a New Year's Six game. I do like their offense. I like Max Johnson. I like Kayshawn Bowdy. I know I butchered that name. And I like Trey Palmer. Their offensive line is also solid. They're a good offensive team, but my God, they are bad defensively. Outside of Eli Ricks, do they have any other good defender? You can't allow Dorian Thompson Robinson to complete just nine passes for 260 yards. The guy threw three touchdowns. He looked like the second coming of Troy Aikman out there. Zach Charbonnet was outstanding. Britton Brown was outstanding. Greg Dulcich was outstanding. This UCLA offense that really isn't anything special looked like the greatest offense in the world on Saturday. I mean, this is UCLA we're talking about. A team that hasn't won more than four games since Chip Kelly got there. But LSU made this Bruins offense look like the greatest show on turf. I saw people saying that This is more proof of Joe Brady's greatness 
It wasn't the LSU offense that lost that game. It was the defense. That has nothing to do with Brady. Ed Orgeron needs to get this defense whipped into shape. The offense is solid. It'll do really good things. But that defense needs to be improved sooner rather than later. All right, now I'll give you some NHL Volk talk. And I'll start with the Red Wings signing Philip Roenick to a three-year extension worth $13.2 million. And this is a great move for the Red Wings. They don't have a lot to be excited about, obviously. But Roenick is one of the guys that their fans can get behind and say, hey, we've got a true building block here. Every year that he's been in the NHL, he's had at least 23 points. Last year, he had 26 points in 56 games. He's excellent at setting up his teammates. He's not as bad defensively as his plus-minus would indicate. He's a Red Wing. That's not gonna help your plus-minus. I like Roenick. This is a really good move for the Red Wings. Job well done by them. Moving on now to the Canadians replacing Jesperi Kotkaniemi with Christian Dvorak. The Canadians did not match the offer sheet that the Hurricanes signed Kotkaniemi to. So Kotkaniemi will be a Hurricane that left a big hole in the Habs' center core, but they replaced it very quickly by trading for Dvorak, previously of the Arizona Coyotes. They gave up a conditional first rounder in this coming NHL draft and a second rounder in 2024. Here are the conditions on that first rounder. The Coyotes will receive the better of the Habs' first round pick and the Hurricanes' first round pick. The Hurricanes gave that pick to the Canadians as compensation for signing Cote Kaniemi. The first rounder that the Coyotes are going to get is semi-top 10 protected. So if one of those two picks are in the top 10 of this coming draft, the Coyotes are getting the worst of the two picks. If hypothetically the Canadians pick is 9 and the Hurricanes pick is 10, The Coyotes are getting 10. This is actually a great move by the Canadians. I had a feeling that they wouldn't re-sign Cote Kaniemi. It would just put too much of a strain on their salary cap. Cote Kaniemi is due to make over 6 mil this year. Dvorak is making just 4.45. That's a big difference. And the cherry on top is that I think Dvorak is better than Kotkaniemi. Christian Dvorak has four years in the NHL where he's put up over 30 points. Kotkaniemi only did it in his rookie year. Dvorak has four years in the NHL where he's put up at least 15 goals. Kotkaniemi hasn't done that once. 
So yeah, the Hurricanes got their comeuppance on the Canadians by signing away Code Kaniemi, but the Canadians got the last laugh because they replaced Code Kaniemi with a better player in Dvorak. Maybe this is a little bit of an overpay to give up a first and a second for a guy who's never had 20 goals in a season and has never had 40 points in a season is tough. But the Canadians had to do something to replace Code Kaniemi. This is a justifiable overpay. Great job by the Canadians and the Coyotes. This will help their rebuild immensely. I'll close this show out with some NFL vault talk. Starting with the Ravens signing Mark Andrews to a four-year extension worth $56 million in terms of total value and AAV. This makes him the third highest paid tight end in the NFL behind just George Kittle and Travis Kelsey. You know what? Andrews deserves it. For starters, it was his birthday yesterday, so this means that the Ravens don't have to get him a birthday gift. They could just give him the contract. Secondly, there's no question that Mark Andrews is one of the five best tight ends in the NFL. In no particular order, it's Kittle, Kelsey, Andrews, Darren Waller, and Kyle Pitts. Yes, I'm putting Pitts in the top five. That's how great I think he's going to be. Last year, Andrews had 58 catches for 701 yards and 7 touchdowns. He was actually the second leading receiver on the Ravens last year behind just Marquise Brown. He's shown that he can produce in the playoffs. This contract is more than fair for him. Great job by the Ravens. Moving on now to the Raiders cutting Tanner Muse. It's okay if you don't know that name, but it is important to talk about him being cut because he was a third-round pick by the Raiders in not this past draft, but the draft before. He was the 100th overall pick. So if you're keeping score... You'll know that of the Raiders' seven picks in that draft, all within the first four rounds, the Raiders have already moved on from two of them. They traded Lynn Bowden, their first third-round pick, to the Dolphins before he ever played a regular season game. And now they're cutting Tanner Muse before he ever played in a regular season game. Muse had a foot injury that resulted in him missing his whole rookie season. I defended the Bowden trade when it happened. I said if you really think that you made a mistake in taking him, cut your losses now rather than trying to make it work and losing any chance of getting something of value for him. It was a bad look that they had to trade Bowden, but I did defend it at the time. This, though, is impossible to defend. Okay, the guy missed 
his rookie season. And yeah, Muse didn't set the world on fire in the preseason. He had just a 59.3 overall grade according to Pro Football Focus. But you cannot give up on two third rounders from the same draft before they ever played in a game for you. One is bad enough, but it's sort of kind of justifiable in a weird way. You've got to let Muse play a little bit. It's not like you're trading him for peanuts. You cut him. It's done. You're not going to get any value for him. So why not just wait a little bit? Maybe something crazy happens. You don't gain anything by cutting him now. This is a bad move by the Raiders. They deserve all the heat that they're getting. Criticize John Gruden all you want. Criticize Mike Mayock all you want. They deserve it over this. Here's the thing, though. What if I were to tell you that there was another team that just did something similar, that just cut their third rounder in the 2020 draft, put him on their practice squad, and just cut their fourth rounder from the 2020 draft. Saw him go to the Panthers. He's now on their practice squad. You know who I'm talking about? The New York Jets. All the heat that you're giving the Raiders, you need to give Joe Douglas. I understand that what the Raiders did is different. Bowden didn't play a game for the Raiders before he was traded. And Muse didn't play a regular season game for the Raiders before he was cut. But the point is, the Raiders moved on from those guys. Less than two years after they were drafted. The Jets just did that. They've moved on from Zuniga. He's on their practice squad. He doesn't fit into their future plans. And James Morgan is now a Panther. What the Rainers did is worse, but it's very similar to what the Jets did. Joe Douglas deserves a lot of heat for what he did in not this past draft, but the draft before. If you're going to criticize Gruden and Mayock, you got to criticize Douglas too. It's impossible for me to not draw a parallel there. I'll close this show out by eulogizing Tunch Ilkin, who died on Saturday at the age of 63 from complications from ALS. When you think about the great offensive linemen in the 80s, who are the first guys who pop into your head? Anthony Munoz, Mike Webster, Dwight Stevenson, Russ Grimm, Max Montoya, Randy Cross, Joe Jacoby, and Dan Alexander, right? It would take you a while to get to Tunchelkin. The thing is, though, maybe Elkin wasn't at the Munoz and Webster tier, but he was certainly in that tier below. Here's a guy who was a part of some solid Steelers teams. He just missed their four Super Bowls in six years. Their last Super Bowl win of that era was in 1980, so it was the 79 team. Ilkin was drafted 
1980. He was a sixth round pick out of Indiana State. He had to grind to earn his way onto the Steelers. And it took him a while to become a full time starter. But he did get there in 1983. The Steelers moved on from Larry Brown and replaced him with the younger Ilkin. They were also forced to move on from Terry Bradshaw in favor of Cliff Stout. The Steelers did make the playoffs that year. They went 10-6. and They won the AFC Central. But they got destroyed by the Raiders in the divisional round, 38-10. That started the Mark Malone era. And Malone wasn't a terrible quarterback. His first year as the Steelers' starting quarterback, they went 9-7. and seven. They won the AFC Central. They upset the Broncos 24-17 in the divisional round, but then they got creamed by the Dolphins in the AFC Championship game, 45-28. to Then the Steelers had some lean years, but Elkin kept on giving them good play at right tackle. In 1988, according to Pro Football Reference, Ilkin led the Steelers in approximate value. He made the Pro Bowl that year. The thing is, though, you don't want an offensive lineman being your best player. The Steelers went 5-11 that year. The Steel Curtain defense was a distant memory. Then Rod Rust came in and completely re-energized that defense. Didn't make them great, but they were vastly improved. The Steelers went 9-7. and seven. Ilkin made his second straight Pro Bowl. The Steelers upset the Oilers in the wild card round 26 to 23 Gary Anderson kicked a game winning 50 yard field goal he kicked four field goals in that game he was really the seminal reason why the Steelers won that game then the Broncos narrowly beat the Steelers 24 to 23 in the divisional round. His last really good season was in 92, Bill Cowher's first year as Steelers head coach. The Steelers went 11-5, and they won the AFC Central, but they got destroyed by the Bills in the divisional round, 24-3. to Ilkin is a member of the Steelers all-time team. At tackle, he's paired with Larry Brown, the man who he replaced. He was a really good player, a beloved figure in Pittsburgh. ALS is an absolutely terrible disease. It can claim even the strongest among us May he rest in peace. Before I let you go, I do have some updates for you. Tomorrow will be a normal episode of the Jacob Volk Show with an interview. I'm going to chat with Brian Martin, the author of the book on Barney Dreyfus. The day after that will be my NFL season preview. That'll be the regular episode of the Jacob Volk Show. I'm going to be doing that solo. Nick's schedule is kind of crazy, he told me. 
that's perfectly fine. I have no problem doing it by myself. I did it last year by myself. I'll do it this year by myself. Friday will be another regular episode of the Jacob Volk Show with an interview. I'm going to chat with Lou Friedman, a friend of the show. This interview will be about his book on the 1930 MLB season. That night, you'll get my New York Jets season preview, where I'm going to go position by position, breaking down the team. I'll give you my final record pick. It's going to be a lot of fun. Until next time, I am Jacob Volk saying, Happy belated anniversary, Mom and Dad.